To begin with, uh, let's acknowledge that Queens is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Um, we should be grateful to be able to live and learn on this land and to be supported by it. Uh, the legacy of colonial conquest is obviously intimately intertwined with today's event, a dark relationship that bears some sort of reflection. Um, Queen's Jewish Studies program is very pleased to be able to host today's event. Um, that, that it's a pressing concern is unfortunately unignorable. The weight of violence forces us currently to think about the present and the future, which, which is hard for people like me who prefer to think about the past. But today's symposium will, of course, help us on this. Um, I don't want to waste your entries, but I do wish to thank everyone involved, um, those who have come here, and especially to Allison, who is operating behind the scenes today to run today's event. So thank you, all of you. And so I'm going to pass the event over to Dr. Marna Singham, who is going to, who has assembled today's panel of guests for us. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I know we're um, all undergoing a kind of webinar fatigue and Zoom fatigue these days, and I uh, appreciate you uh, making some time. Uh, the idea for this event arose basically uh, because me and a lot of my colleagues, uh, many of whom are in uh, on this event or in this event, um, who study political violence, um, hate movements, social polarization, misinformation, et cetera, are constantly being asked, you know, uh, about the last four years and 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 the kind of long-term significance of the last four years. Was it just another presidency? Uh, was it just another four years, or was there something unique about it? Was there something kind of particularly harmful about the Trump presidency that we'll need to get a handle on? Um, going forward. So uh, so I nagged some of my friends and here we are. <laughs> um, I uh, especially want to thank uh, Dustin Atlas and the Jewish Studies Program, uh, as well as the School of Religion here at Queens for making this event possible. Um, I told Dustin the idea and it didn't really much convincing. It's always nice. Um, today also marks the second anniversary of the Christchurch terror attack in New Zealand. Um, when a far-right shooter killed 51 people and injured 40 at two separate mosques, um, all the while uh, live streaming the whole thing. Um, so we want to remember the victims uh, and their families today as well. Uh, just a few words about the format. Um, we have four speakers who will each speak for about 15 minutes, um, and then we will open it up for questions. You can post your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom um, as we go but we'll take the questions at the end. Um, we might be a bit biased and allow some Queen students to jump the queue, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, we've set aside time until noon uh, if we need it, depending on how vibrant the discussion gets. Um, I'll, I'll kind of provide short intros to the speakers as we go, but and post longer, um, <clears throat> longer bios in the chat uh, if you're interested in reading it. Um, so our first speaker is Oren Siegel. Uh, he's the Vice President of the Center on Extremism at the Anti-Defamation League. Oren and his team focused mainly on combating extremism and hate in the real world and online. In 2006, he was recognized by the FBI for his exceptional service in the public interest. Oren, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Amar. Really appreciate uh, uh, being here. And um, uh, also, uh, obviously, not far from thought is is uh, is New Zealand and Christchurch on this terrible anniversary. Uh, it seems like anytime uh, there's a webinar or a conference or any time to speak, there's we're always in some sort of uh, anniversary. Um, and I think that's sort of part of why we're having this uh, call today, uh, this 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 meeting. Um, you know, issues of extremism and and bigotry, anti-Semitism, and all forms of hate. Um, you know, have been leading the headlines every single day. And so hopefully we're, we're going to be able to make a little bit of sense uh, out of this. Uh, my goal is to provide some information on uh, some of the resources uh, and insights that have at ADL on anti-Semitism and extremism, um, and also touch on the, the sort of broader landscape uh, of what we're seeing as well. So I'm going to try to do my first thing here, which is share my screen. And if I can get a thumbs up just so people see it, I know if people see it, awesome. All right, so we're already, we're already doing okay. So let me start by just talking a little bit about what the Center on Extremism at the ADL is. ADL's mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice for all. I think that mission is particularly important to the work of those of us who uh, spend pretty much every waking hour um, trying to combat extremism and hate. 
Uh, I have the, the honor of working with a group of analysts and investigators and fellows who are literally, you know, going where the hate is, whether it's, you know, every possible online platform that you can imagine. Um, and, and ultimately what motivates this work is I think this sort of timeless mission that ADL has. We know that the only way that you combat anti-Semitism is to fight all other forms of hatred. And frankly, the way that you combat racism and Islamophobia and misogyny, et cetera, is, is to fight anti-Semitism. And that's, that's what our team is dedicated to. Um, the work that we do, um, it, uh, I sort of mentioned that we go where the hate is, but like how we leverage what we do, I think is super important as well. So when we see, uh, you know, direct threats, specific threats against communities um, in our regular monitoring, we share this information with law enforcement. We are tracking individual extremist groups and movements uh, and, and ideologies. We're online trying to see how they reach, recruit and radicalize folks. And to the degree that, you know, we're able to provide real time information to prevent uh, an issue from happening. That's just part of our mission. Uh, we also leverage our resources, which I'll talk a little bit about with the tech industry. Um, you know, they uh, sometimes are responsive and sometimes not. Uh, but the point is we're able to help them understand the exploitation of their platforms. At the end of the day, we want to help secure the safety of communities around the country and around the world. So I, I wanted to mention uh, first is this one resource that people might find useful. We've been tracking six different uh, data sets for a period of time. Um, that we have on what we call the heat map, hate, extremism, anti-Semitism, and terrorism. That's the acronym. Uh, and so we have 18,000 points on the map, and each one uh, can be uh, broken down into state or city uh, or town. It's searchable in that way. Um, and again, we think it's really important to collect this data because the only way that you can really um, resource to the threat is to understand what's happening in communities. The only way to compel government officials uh, to do advocacy is to have the data and let them know what's happening in their backyard. So here's just an example of one of the data sets. You can pick it uh, by type, year over year. So here are anti-Semitic incidents over the last three years, 2018 to 2020. And here's another uh, uh, view of this map, which includes now white supremacist propaganda. And I'll get into that a little bit more uh, shortly. But you see that there is an overlap between sort of these white circles, the bigger the circle, the more incidents happen in that community, and some of the white supremacist propaganda. And I think at the end of the day, that's sort of what I'm being asked to talk about, not just sort of anti-Semitism and how we see it, but also how does that inform and animate extremist movements, in particular on the extreme right? And I know some of the other speakers here will really delve into that um, even more. Here are some examples because I probably should say a trigger warning, but I really think it's important for people to see what we are actually talking about. Here are examples of the types of flyers that we have seen, for example, show up in different parts of the country. This is the type of flyers, by the way, that are extremist in nature, but leverage anti-Semitic ideas, right? And so there's a whole range of other flyers and propaganda that we see that maybe focuses on other uh, communities, but these specifically. I think sort of speak to some of the elements of anti-Semitism that we see play throughout many of the, the narratives that motivate these, these groups. So whether it's you know, Jewish control of the media, sort of viewing uh, uh, sort of Judaism as a hateful idea um, or as Jews as being in some ways um, um, like degenerates, whether it's sexual degenerates or controlling uh, power, greed. I mean, these are the classic anti-Semitic conspiracies Conspiracies, by the way, that motivate and animate various other ones. Uh, we keep a sort of a tracker day to day on our website, um, but I think our, our anti-Semitic incident report that we do every year, I think really speaks volumes about sort of the level of anti-Semitism in the United States. So each year we put together uh, a report that looks at harassment, vandalism and assault in the United States. We've been doing this since 1979. And in 2019, which was the last year we have the full data, Honestly, we were about a month early from us having the, the full data for 2020. So keep your eyes open for that. We're not ready to release that information. But the last time we released our data for 2019, 2,107 incidents, it was the highest number of anti-Semitic incidents recorded to ADL since 1979, basically in over 40 years. 
And I think one of the um, important notes here, as you can see in the graph, is that this has been sort of a historically high time, right? And the question I think people get is like, why now? What happened in the last you know, four years, which would make anti-Semitic incidents increase? Now, I think there's sort of a tendency to say, well, maybe it's you know, the fact that our former president was sort of normalizing uh, types of hatred. And listen, I think to some degree, we can't ignore that. But I don't think you can trace the rise of anti-Semitic incidents in the United States to any one person. And frankly, I would say anytime there's a normalization of other forms of hatred, misogyny, Islamophobia, anti-immigrant rhetoric, that does have an impact on those who feel comfortable to lash out against Jews. Again, that speaks to that sort of mission I was talking about earlier on. I should note that there were like three major attacks in 2019 against the Jewish community. A white supremacist opened fire at a Chabad in Poway, California, um, killing one person. In Jersey City, New Jersey, two people um, associated with the Black Hebrew Israelite sect, and that this particular one, one of the more anti-Semitic sects, not that they all are, um, attacked a Jewish grocery store and killed three people there. And then later in December, just a couple of weeks later, there was an attack at a rabbi's house in Muncie, New York, um, with a knife. And so I think what that shows too is that anti-Semitism is not the sole domain of any one extremist movement. Um, violence and anti-Semitism um, you know, tend to animate a range of extremist movements. Um, again, you know, just to sort of keep it visual uh, so people get a sense, like here's actually the impact that this has on the communities um, that are sort of behind some of those dots on a map that I showed you. And you see that it takes a whole range of different sort of um, uh, 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 sort of uh, narratives in terms of the anti-Semitism that we're seeing on the ground. Some are sort of classic, sort of white supremacist, 1488, which you know uh, is sort of a motto for for white supremacist, the 14 words, and 88 meaning Heil Hitler. Uh, conspiracies like Jews did 9/11. I mean, that's been going on for 20 years. Um, on the top left, you'll see defund Jews. And I included that because they always use sort of the latest narratives and tropes to find a way to put an anti-Semitic twist. So in a, in a time where there's legitimate discussions about defunding police uh, over police brutality issues, um, again, it's sort of like a rhetorical leveraging of that to say defund Jews. And the one in the middle I include because sometimes anti-Semitism uh, rears itself up in sort of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is not mere criticism of Israel, right? That, that, that's not something that we consider anti-Semitic at all. But when somebody targets uh, a sukkah during a high holy day, targeting Jews, not necessarily Israelis, but Jews with a political statement like Free Gaza, that's where um, it sometimes bleeds into anti-Semitism. So those are sort of the things that make up much of what we, we are tracking. Now, I, I should note that in particular, modern white supremacy, because we've seen such a rise in that, and 13% of the incidents in our audit were actually linked to uh, as I showed before, propaganda and white supremacist propaganda in particular, it's important to understand how white supremacy plays a role within modern white supremacist ideology, you know, which is basically centered on the assertion that the white race is in danger of extinction and it's being drowned out by, you know, this rising tide of non-white people who are primarily controlled by the Jews, according to this ideology, right? The problem of, uh, of white supremacy goes beyond just racism and bigotry. You know, it's more than just, uh, it, it's a collection of prejudice, if you, if you will. Um, and it's an ideology whose worldview is deeply seated, like really deeply held. And I think we're gonna hear more about that from our other speakers in the way some people hold very deeply religious beliefs. You know, white supremacists have a loathing uh, of, uh, deep enough to accommodate a whole wide range of different hatreds but they reserve a very special hatred uh, for the Jews. And while, while white supremacists despise and, and fear other races, in many cases, they actually view them as inferior, right? Inferior backgrounds. And they question their ability to actually threaten the dominance of white survival. See, that's where the Jewish sort of element comes in, where you know, Jews being viewed as uh, you know, intelligent, or you know, particularly parasitic, are able to sort of manipulate the levers. And we saw how this place played out very explicitly um, uh, during the, uh, the shooting that we saw in Pittsburgh, right? The deadliest 
uh, uh, attack against the Jewish community in American history. Here's somebody who was animated in many ways based on his online social media uh, um, profiles by an anti-immigrant sentiment, was concerned about the browning of America, right? Demographic changes, believed George Soros was funding a caravan uh, to bring immigrants into this country. But he attacked a Jewish institution, maybe because it was in his area, but also because he saw the Jews ultimately being responsible for manipulating um, our demographics in this country. And again, that's why white supremacists have sort of this specific hatred toward Jews. We saw this show up very explicitly during the corona, uh, the, the pandemic when it began. Um, you know, xenophobia and anti-Asian hatred online and then violence on the ground continues to be a significant issue. Unsurprisingly, when it comes to issues of control and not knowing who to blame or looking for somebody to blame, uh, various anti-Semitic um, conspiracy theories, the sort of standards came out as well. Now, I, I, I know I, I have a limited time, so I, I do want to conclude here. This is sort of a lasting image, right, that started in 2000 and you know, 17, this image of violence in Charlottesville, right? What got us there was the normalization of anti-immigrant, Islamophobic and misogynistic rhetoric. And yet one of the lasting refrains beyond the violence was this concept that the Jews will not replace us. To me, that really spoke to the importance of combating other forms of hatred, but also the centrality of anti-Semitism when you get a whole bunch of extremists coming together into one space. You know, that was ostensibly uh, a, a rally or an event geared against the Confederate uh, monument. And so here we are, you know, uh, in 2021, coming off this other seminal moment in hate in this country. Again, this sort of Confederate idea comes uh, to mind. Um, this image is still, you know, something that I find particularly chilling. Um, but again, I think it speaks to, and people ask, what is the role of anti-Semitism on January 6th? I think we need to understand it without overstating it. And so let me just sort of conclude by saying out of the 350 now or plus uh, individuals who have been arrested, only about 25% of them have actually been affiliated with any sort of known uh, extremist group or, or, or movement, you know, be it uh, QAnon, be it white supremacists, certainly militias like Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, et cetera. And so that means a full 75% were not affiliated with extremists or sort of established extremist movements and groups. To me, that's actually sort of when we're looking into the future and maybe during the Q&A, we can talk a little bit about this. It's like, what does this portend, right? What's on the horizon? Anti-Semitism certainly um, was part of the fundamental ideologies of some of these organizations, like some of the neo-Nazis who showed up. Anti-Semitism is sort of an animating factor more broadly in QAnon, which some of its theories are just so closely aligned um, with some of the anti-Semitic sort of historic conspiracies that we see. So anti-Semitism as being a fundamentally geared toward undermining democratic institutions, I think was at play um, during January 6th. Now I wanna make sort of one for real this time, last comment. Here's a image um, from uh, Baked Alaska, this white supremacist anti-Semite who was one of the folks who stormed the, the Capitol and who was live streaming, right? What he was doing on his phone. And you see on the, on the right-hand side, you have people sort of encouraging this activity, um, literally telling him where to go. In some cases, giving him, you know, cryptocurrency in order to encourage him. Now this is, I, I mentioned this because in the, in the battle to combat anti-Semitism and extremism, I feel like this says it all, right? You have somebody who's part of this extremist loop. He's being encouraged and you know, financially rewarded um, by you know, thousands of people who are watching him. Actually, you know, it occurs to me that we're on the anniversary of Christ Church where this individual is live streaming his attack, bringing people on this journey of hate with him. In many ways, we saw this play out during the Capitol insurrection as well, through live streaming and the ability for people to participate without having to leave their home. So in conclusion, we have a hate symbols database that um, we enable people to sort of learn about some of these symbols to understand you know, uh, and educate themselves about what's around them. I will note context is always key. Don't jump to conclusions. We put out uh, public reports on the sort of globalization of uh, not only uh, anti-Semitism, but white supremacy. We view it as a global terrorist threat. 
but we also think it's super important to give people the data here. And I think people are finally starting to understand the idea that domestic terror threat has been one of the most significant threats amongst us for a long time. We do an annual report on murder and extremism. Uh, we just issued it. And year and year after year, it's right-wing extremists that have killed more Americans than anybody else. The last 10 years, 75% of extremist-related murders in this country have been carried out by right-wing extremists. In some cases, that indeed has been motivated by anti-Semitism. So what I'm going to do is stop here. Maybe during the Q&A, we could talk about like, all right, what are we doing about all this? Maybe there's ways to sort of talk about what are the next steps. But I hope that helps set the framework in terms of the role of anti-Semitism as a broader animating factor uh, for white supremacy and extremism more broadly in the country. Thanks so much. Thanks, Oren. Um, great overview, and I think <clears throat> a very good setup for our next three speakers. Uh, our next speaker is Shannon Foley-Martinez. Uh, since leaving the white supremacist movement over 25 years ago, she has worked within at-risk communities, teaching and developing dynamic resiliency skills. She has helped to build preventive models of counter-extremism, focusing on family values, the importance of individual empathy and intersectional consciousness. Um, Shannon, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning. I don't know if y'all are struggling like I am with the time change here. Everything in my family is off kilter, so who knows what will happen uh, behind me. Um, my heart and biggest love goes out to um, all of the victims and their families of um, the Christchurch attack and all of uh, the murders that have taken place um, perpetrated by um, far-right uh, ideologues. Uh, so um, my heart is always when um, when there are the anniversaries and stuff, it's um, there's always this part of me that's like, if, if I had been born at a different time and my life had been what it is, like that that could have potentially been me. I am uh, 46 years old now. I um, have been out of the white power movement for over 25 years. Um, <laughs> When I was a little girl, I grew up in a family where um, there was a lot of dysfunction um, and codependency. And I felt from my earliest memories that I was the black sheep in my family. Uh, I had like some other protective factors early on in my life, playing a lot of sports. Um, I had a lot of, you know, there were a lot of kids in my neighborhood uh, and things like that. One of the things that wasn't present in my house, so like my parents um, are still married. They've been married for 52 years. So there was no divorce. There was no uh, drug or alcohol addiction. Um, there was no um, physical abuse. Uh, you know, I grew up in the uh, 70s and 80s. So like, you know, like there was corporal punishment, but it was not outside of like the cultural norm at the time. Uh, I was in gifted classes. Um, I did however, um, seemed to come wired to ask why and struggled all the time with, uh, with school and, and understanding arbitrary rules that I, didn't, that I didn't understand. When I was 11, my dad let us know that we were going to move from just outside of Philadelphia, where we live, um, halfway across the country to rural southern Michigan, just north of Toledo, Ohio. When I got there, um, I didn't have the same hair as everyone. I didn't have a talk the same. I didn't listen to the same music. Um, and that sense of not really belonging inside my family now expanded out into the greater world. Um, I felt increasingly uh, alienated and alone. And at the same time, uh, I was beginning early adolescence. So I did, you know, what early adolescents do. And I began trying to like grapple with my identity and was really drawn towards like counterculture which would take the circuitous route through like anti-war, 1960s anti-war culture into skateboarding and then into the punk rock um, movement and scene. When it was time for me to start high school, um, when I was 13 years old, I decided to go uh, across the border from where we were living in Michigan to uh, an all girls uh, private high school in, in Toledo. I thought maybe like, cause you know, like that there would be people there that would all be starting high school together that maybe like the, you know, the place that I could fit in. One of the things, however, that happened was that there was a law, you couldn't play sports um, 
if you if you went to high school in Ohio but didn't have your residency there. Um, and sports had been a lifeline for me. I was a championship athlete. I had, you know, I played all kinds of sports and I had lots of very good uh, relationships with uh, a lot of my coaches. So I go to high school and then, then I lose um, all of the, the rest of the, the adult contacts in my life. And it turns out that uh, that high school, that there were feeder schools. So there were already well-established cliques. So once again, I found myself as um, an outsider. At the end of my freshman year, I would go to a party um, where I started drinking at a party. Um, and by the end of the night, I was sexually assaulted by two men. They were white men. Sometimes people ask. Um, trajectories into hate are very rarely linear. Um, and so when I woke up the mor next morning after that, I, I was like, okay, like, did that really happen? Yes. And then my next thought was that there was no way that I could tell my parents. Um, I knew that they would... Um, blame me for, based on my childhood, um, that they would blame me for lying about where I was going and, uh, and, and drinking at that party uh, more so than they would be upset that I had just been sexually assaulted. So I took all of that trauma completely unprocessed um, and shoved it down. And as we know, unprocessed trauma does not dissipate, it festers. And in my case, it festered into deep self-loathing, deep self-hatred, which manifested mainly as rage that I didn't understand and didn't have the school skills and tools to process. In the punk scene where I was, the angriest, um, the angriest people that I knew were um, on the periphery and they were the, the neo-Nazi white power skinheads. And I think that the rage in me really resonated with the rage they displayed. And I started um, spending more and more time with these people. It was a place where it was okay to be angry. It was also a place where, because I felt so worthless, um, that I didn't have to be good to be there. All I had to do was be angry. Um, and I hated myself and the whole world. So this, these messages of hate for me um, made actually this like rage that I felt a little bit more manageable um, and gave some focus to project this up out of me. I, over the next four or five years, like I built, in my case, it was a physical echo chamber that these began to be the only people and the only groups that I associated with um, going deeper and deeper. Um, I would sp spend time all over the country um, traveling around to uh, diff spend time with like different sorts of cells of people uh, in the white power movement. Mostly uh, I was involved in the neo-Nazi uh, skinhead uh, seen, but towards the end of my time in the movement that that morphed into spending more time with um, anti-government separatists um, and uh, more like militia-based uh, violence, uh, ex ex explicitly white power uh, militia violence. Uh, I would end up not having anywhere to go when I turned 19, and I very luckily um, was given the opportunity to move in with um, uh, my boyfriend's mom, my boyfriend at the time, his mom, um, who didn't know uh, what our ideology was. And it was within that context that the echo chamber that I had built had began to break up. And I began to have some like cognitive opening and enough stability in my life to be able to shift and begin to examine like, is this really who I am? Is this really what I want to be? And, you know, and that, that the broken need set that I had began to be met authentically um, by this woman and her family and um, much more effectively than anything that was happening inside the movement. I had left when I was about 20. Um, for the next three years, I was no longer part, you know, I didn't even identify as, you know, a white supremacist in any way. Um, but I didn't grapple with like, how did I get there? What, what had happened to me that this had been part of my life? My oldest son was born when I was 23, and that was the beginning um, for me of like, okay, like I know I don't want to parent my kids how I was parented, and I definitely don't want my kids to grow up and be like me. Um, and so that began for me this like really intense um, examination and grappling with processing shame, and it would be another 10 years before I would be diagnosed with PTSD and another 20 years before I'd be diagnosed with CPTSD um, to understand and continue to like get information and better skills. Um, part of the 
process of that was that when my, when I was pregnant, I was like, I really, I never want to be, I never want my kids to like accidentally find out like, oh, hey, BT dubs, my mom was a Nazi. So I just made that part of um, the things that we talked about uh, the whole time that they, that they were growing up. A side effect of this was that because I shared, because I shared um, the worst things that I had done and the worst things that had happened to me, other people began to um, seek me out to talk to me about their things. For me, mentoring people as they um, have left these movements came very organically. And it's something that I've been doing for over um, 20 years. While I was in the, the movement, uh, anti-Semitism was like just a part of everything that, that we did, that it was part of the messaging of every part of, of, um, of our belief system, every part of every action that there was um, flyering and graffitiing at um, places of worship. Um, I think that um, one of the struggles uh, is that, um, we have this intersectionality in America where, you know, it's like we're talking about class and race and ethnicities and, um, and things like that. And I think it's incredibly complex when we are talking about um, our Jewish uh, uh, brethren that, that there's this intersectionality of race and ethnicity and, and um, that it becomes easy for people who um, are looking for groups of others to to blame for why they don't have the resources they need, why they don't have the the um, uh, the power that they need, why you know why they don't feel like they have everything that is rightfully theirs, or that their grandparents' generation had promised them to be theirs. That there's this um, this grappling with like, okay, well, whose fault is that that I don't have what I need? And as um, Oren had uh, mentioned that it's, you know, that as it's interwoven in these overtly racist spaces, that there has to be a layer of complexity there for like who is mobilizing the resources for those attacking, you know, this in-group of like white folks or whatever to take away the resources that that they've had. Um, uh, in terms of, um, Trump over the last four years, uh, I mean, my work, my work has amplified exponentially um, the number of families and people reaching out um, who are either concerned about loved ones um, or friends or peers and also people seeking help to um, exit these groups and spaces um, has just grown exponentially over the last four years, um, especially so just over the last, I mean, since January. Um, I, the, some of the messaging and some of the demographics of people have changed, um, that it's mostly they're, um, up until maybe about four years ago, most of the people who reached out to me were, um, uh, in their upper twenties to like middle age, uh, trying to like exit these spaces. And I, it has overwhelmingly shifted younger. Um, for me, there's like a difference from when I was in to now that so much of this is now playing out and happening uh, in an online realm. And, you know, for me, it was actually very unlikely that my like broken, vulnerable self would collide with these ideas and ideologies and people and communities. Um, and now, like when I go to schools um, and, and talk to kids and talk to them about their online activities and stuff, and I ask, you know, like, like, are you on Twitch? Are you on like, what are you doing online? And then ask them who has seen racist or anti-Semitic comments or content online that a hundred percent of the hands go up. So it is at this point, a certainty people will in fact collide with these uh, ideas, ideologies, and communities. And I think in my experience, overwhelmingly, we are not doing a very good job. Most parents do not um, engage with their children specifically um, to form an action plan and to help them identify um, racist and anti-Semitic comments and content and memes and what to do like when they encounter those things, like have a plan of like, do you report and block? Do you screenshot? What do you do? Um, and um, I think for me going forward that um, some of my biggest fears are that 
uh, there seems to be an increase in um, apocalyptic narratives. Uh, and uh, so much of the time, apocalyptic narratives where it's like, you know, the, the end is coming, um, you know, that the whole world is changing and things are changing at an increasing rate, I think, um, because of the internet. Um, and people feel destabilized in that, that there's also just, you know, that the difficulty is that we're talking about very personal stories, which you'll also hear from um, my colleagues, um, that we're talking about very personal stories and very personal drivers that, um, that allow people to end up being in these spaces that are all happening inside a greater like cultural and societal story that's happening. And so these things work together to create these like amplifications um, and that we have to address and deal with both of those things at the same time, which is really difficult. Um, I worry about this increase in apocalyptic narratives because it increases the stakes and the likelihood that people will engage and feel justified in engaging in, um, in murderous violence. Um, that if you, um, you know, if you are trying to, uh, if you are framing what you are doing as saving the world or that the world is ending and you need to bring forth some sort of new world or whatever, that justifying murderous violence inside those belief systems becomes increasingly easy to do so. It's also historically true that apocalyptic um, narratives are overwhelmingly anti-Semitic, um, you know, that, that for anything that can't be explained um, is almost always placed on uh, Jews or some sort of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. I think uh, I'm also worried about the increasing use of cryptocurrency as funding so that people and groups can circumvent the bank system and that this is in part due to um, anti-Semitic beliefs where, you know, that there's this anti-Semitic trope that is like Jews control the finances of the world. And one of the ways that people are able to circumvent uh, their participation in, in that is through cryptocurrency, which is much harder to like track. And, you know, and I feel like that we, in our infancy of understanding and being able to disrupt the flow of cryptocurrencies. Uh, and I also worry about um, an increase in like, uh, state and symbolic and infrastructure attacks, smaller scale um, attacks locally based. I think it will probably be a while before we see some sort of mass gathering um, happen again because there's so much surveillance right now. Um, I think that that will be incredibly difficult to, um, to, to mobilize to at this point. But smaller groups, one to two person terror cells take, you know, attacking state and symbolic and uh, infrastructure kits, um, that those are things that I worry about. And I, and I think just as like a mom and as, you know, as me, as a person that I worry about our ability to engage in complex thought and complex discussion that one of, you know, one of my oldest kids, you know, that will see our, our sort of like catchphrases, like simplicity is the enemy, that we seem to have an increasingly difficult time um, engaging with ideas complexly and holding multiple truths to be true at the same time and seeing um, that there are many ways to um, grapple with the problems that we face. Uh, one of the things true working with um, the people um, with whom I work is that um, as multitudinous layers of trauma are there and then exploited inside these spaces, that it's this, that your brain is reaching for simplistic solutions, for navigating to make easier the, the very complex work of navigating through the world. And especially that we have an increasingly complex world that we find ourselves in. And we have increasingly difficult problems that we um, urgently need to grapple with. Um, and get to a, a common story so we can start from a place of truth and then reach so, towards conciliation and transformation of our future. And those things are incredibly complex. Um, and these narratives offer people this chance to 
make much easier the work of navigating that complexity. And so that is also um, a, a, an intense worry for me. And so I will turn that back. Or I think I hit all the stuff that I was supposed to hit. <laughs> maybe, maybe not in the most linear fashion, but I think I, I think I hit all the things that I was supposed to hit. So I'll give it back to you. Uh, oh, great. Uh, thanks very much, Shannon. Um, I've, I've heard you tell your story a few times now. It's always, um, it's always very, very important to, important to hear. Um, our next speaker is Chuck Leek. Uh, he was active involved with the white supremacist groups for over 15 years, beginning in the 1980s. Um, after learning that a girlfriend was half Jewish, he began to question those beliefs, which eventually led him uh, to begin a long disengagement process. In 2011, uh, Chuck was introduced to Life After Hate, um, which is an organization in the US that um, helps people leave far right movements, um, and with their support has begun speaking publicly against his former beliefs. Um, Chuck. Thank you, Amar. Um, thank you to the Queen's University for putting this on. It's it's an important topic in a, in a critical time. Um, I really appreciate being here. So um, just I'm going to run down the, the um, discussion points that we were given and, and try and keep it coherent. <laughs> if anybody else is on the West Coast here with me on the day of daylight saving time, I sympathize. and. Um, Forgive me if I'm a little scattered. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, my name is Chuck Leake. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, born in 1967, and I'm 53 years old. Um, I entered the military at 18 and, and was radicalized while I was in the military. Um, but that was sort of predicated on being exposed to white supremacist symbology and, and iconography for most of my childhood in, in an attitude of white supremacy, even in a, you know, a supposedly liberal area like Los Angeles, quote unquote, um, over basically my entire childhood in the seventies, it was very common to see white supremacist symbols um, in school. And anyway, uh, I suffered some, as Shannon, and as most of us who have come out of this uh, system of beliefs um, will testify, suffered some significant childhood trauma. I was molested by a babysitter, a male babysitter, when I was 10 years old um, on kind of an ongoing basis and uh, never dealt with that trauma moving into my teenage years and, and early adulthood. And basically that became this source of um, shame and, and self-hatred and rage that and, and didn't really understand it all. much much of the memory had been blocked out of my mind um, and I didn't understand where all this was coming from inside myself but I turned all these feelings out onto the world and and I sort of radicalized progressively um, and then met some, neo-Nazi skinheads when I was 18 in the military, living in San Diego at the time, and listening to the music, um, moved into the, the role of, of leadership in, in the San Diego chapter of the White Aryan Resistance skinheads, ended up doing some time in prison for an assault. Um, I was involved with Tom Metzger at the time. I got out of prison. Um, did my parole, got, moved out of state, was with uh, some militia type Christian identity groups. I was a Christian identity believer. And for people who aren't familiar with Christian identity, it's a, a explicitly neo-Nazi, um, it's an explicitly neo-Nazi, um, I'm drawing a blank on a word right now, but it, it's, a, it's a Christian so-called Christian belief that distorts the Bible to um, to um, call the Jewish people the descend literal descendants of Satan, like they are literally the children of Satan in this belief system, and they're the Jewish people in the Christian identity belief system are directly responsible for all of the evils in the world and directly responsible for trying to eliminate the white race. And the, 
according to Christian identity, the white race is the only race that can be saved and the only people, true people of God. Um, so I was in this belief system for, you know, decades, basically. Um, and uh, I was going through a divorce and, and met a girl and was dating this girl for about a year and a half. And we were sitting and having a discussion one morning at a, at a restaurant in, in a booth across from each other. And I mean, understanding who I and what I was, she drops to me that, well, you know, I'm half Jewish. And needless to say, I was a little stunned. And I sat there for, you know, a, a good minute, like speechless, basically processing this stuff. And then in that time, I, I came to this realization that I cared more about this person who you know I loved at the time than I did about all of these beliefs that I had been espousing for years and years and years. And so that was kind of the, the my turning point um, getting out of the movement. It, it took a long time after that. That wasn't like I was out that day or anything like that, but it did begin the process, which culminated in 2011 with me becoming associated with Life After Hate and, you know, um, starting to tell my story publicly and, and, you know, doing these types of things. Um, so the way, um, the way that anti-Semitism played out in the groups that I was involved with, um, as I said, we were directly blaming the Jewish people for all of our problems. It was a plot against white people. Um, and so we would um, distribute Tom Metzger's literature. We would put up stickers around town. This was you know, in the days, very early days of the internet. You didn't have social media, um, a lot of um, like physical going to places and distributing literature as our recruitment method based primarily. Um, uh, people were committing vandalism, you know, acts of vandalism on synagogues. One of the things that we did specifically in San Diego, um, we were a very violent group of skinheads. We would go into Jew the Jew or excuse me, the, the gay community here in San Diego and, and commit acts of um, violence against gay people. That was a, a really um, significant target. And um, minorities, a lot of us ended up going to prison for attacks on minorities. Um, and something, something that I wanted to kind of point out, another thing, that is a hallmark of premises groups is infighting. That that was one of the one of the factors that started me questioning the whole belief system. Is here's this thing that talks about brotherhood and we're you know united as a people and all that. But I would say easily sixty percent of the violence I witnessed while I was in was movement people committing acts of violence against each other. Um, just. It, there, there's lots and lots of infighting and it's a hallmark of these groups. Um, and it's also a, a way to um, leverage their uh, potential exit in, in my mind. Um, so during, during the Trump administration, um, I, I noticed right away that there was a, a huge uptake uptick in um incidents and and you know new, new stories about extremist attacks and um charlottesville happened and then all of a sudden there was a, a huge amount of media interest in the the narrative and the groups and what had seemed like during the obama years um kind of had faded into the background like you know here we ha now have a black president so the problem is solved kind of um just the the trump becoming president and his um his anti-immigrant rhetoric and his known you know his known not so well hidden um racist beliefs i mean the the um 
Central Park Five, the way he reacted to that, his birtherism, it was very poorly concealed, um, a, a veneer that he was, you know, he was, I believe that he is a, an actual um, racist. I, I, I'm sure that in his private life, he is very explicitly racist, but, I, you know, I mean, obviously that's hearsay and I can't prove that. Um, but there was a huge uptick because these groups now felt like um, they had a champion. They felt like they have their chance now. Like during my time in, um, like we were seeking a race war, like actively trying to work towards creating a race war to separate America for white people only, you know. Um, it was it was a, a plan that was engaged in by movement leaders in the 70s and 80s, Tom Metzger, uh, Lewis Beam, James Mason. These guys were all pushing this narrative of, um, you know, do things to start this race war so we can defeat the government in, you know, whatever, and take over the Pacific Northwest in some cases, or, you know, the entire country in other cases, and create a whites only America. Um, Trump gave these groups a degree of hope that this was going to happen during his administration and that he would actually, you know, um, facilitate some of this partially. Uh, he, uh, so the, the, there was this, you know, huge uptick in activity and, and correspondingly a huge uptick in, um, you know, media interest and, and, um, also disengagement, but I don't, you know, in my role in life after hate has never really been intervention or disengagement. I've done, you know, panel stuff and media appearances. So that's what I noticed during the Trump administration. Um, and then so the, what I'm worried about going forward is probably the most important part of what I would like to say right today. Um, so in the mid eighties, when I was involved with Tom Metzger and the white Aryan resistance, there was a, a, a distinct plan put into place by Tom Metzger and, and other high profile movement leaders, David Duke and, and some of the other guys I mentioned, Mason and, and um, the, they engaged in a course of action where they were telling us, if you have not had any felony, felony convictions, if you're, you know, if don't shave your head, don't get tattoos, get into the military, get, get into police forces, become a lawyer, get into government. This was a, this was a, an actual, you know, it was an explicit plan by these movement leaders that began in the early eighties, mid eighties. And I, I believe that there are a significant number of people that are in positions of power that, that are plants from this, um, from this era, uh, you know, Christopher Hassan was arrested uh, a year, year and a half ago. Um, he was in the Coast Guard at the time, but he had served in a couple of other branches of the military and he's contemporary with me. He's my age. He was involved with Metzger at the same time. And he spent, you know, a good 25, 30 years undercover in the military until he was finally caught. Um, a, with a plan to um, engage in a significant terror attack. Um, so, and he's not the only one. And I think it's a huge problem that we have to address. I know that, you know, the government is now making some strides. I know our uh, Lloyd Austin, the new secretary of defense is, is very um, seriously looking at, you know, diving into the problem in the military, but there's a huge problem in the U S military, especially, but police forces as well, I believe with, uh, infiltrating white supremacists, you know, the, the Adam Waffen division, we saw some of their propaganda in Oren's presentation. Um, they were, Adam Waffen division was started by national guardsman, Brandon Russell, and they investigated him and, you know, he had been involved in some, some murder stuff with his roommates 
And his apartment was just chock full of um, Nazi paraphernalia, a framed portrait of um, the Oklahoma City bomber, Tim Tim McVeigh. And I almost forgot his name. It's really early here. (laughs) Um, And the, the military investigated his case and came to the conclusion that there was no way that a reasonable person would, um, would have a way to know that he was a white supremacist. Um, just, just not true. I, I was investigated by the military in 1988 and lied and dissembled when NCIS investigated me. And they came to the same conclusion that, you know, well, not that they came to the conclusion that I hadn't done anything wrong, according to the military, uh, the UCMJ, even though I was, you know, I I was on the news in San Diego, having espoused, you know, or or associated anyway with neo-Nazi skinheads. Um, They took my, my um, denials at face value and, and I received no, disciplinary action whatsoever from the military for being a member of a white supremacist group. Uh, I say this because, you know, that was the late eighties, but they're doing the same thing in 2000. I think it was 2016 or 2017 with Brandon Russell, who was the, the creator of one of the most dangerous terrorist domestic terror cells in the United States. Um, so I, I'm, really, really significantly concerned about infiltration, about the government really taking seriously the the problem of white supremacists in the military and police forces and beginning to um, be transparent and open about their efforts to combat this and and, um, taking steps to really actually do something about the problem. uh, how how close am I on my fifteen minutes, Amar? Um, you have two two minutes. If you have any closing words? Um, no, I you know that's I, I will cut it short. I I hope to see some good questions in the Q and A. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Chuck. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is uh, Brad Galloway. Brad was a fixture in the North American right wing extremist movement for thirteen years and was the president of a racist skinhead gang for five of those years. After leaving the movement, he now works to combat combat hate and extremism with a variety of organizations, including the Center on Hate, Bias, and Extremism at uh, Ontario Tech University in Oshawa as a case manager with Life After Hate, and also conducts research and intervention work uh, with the Organization for the Prevention of Violence in Edmonton. Uh, Over to you, Brad. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Amar. Um, <clears throat> and thanks again for the uh, invitation uh, to talk here. Um, I was like in, engaging with uh, these different uh, panels at universities. Um, yeah, it's so, so many great points have been some uh, brought up so far. Um, I'm not really sure how to, how to follow up with the, after these presenters. However, I'll do my best and um, yeah, I guess I'll jump right into, into some, some narratives of my, my time in the movement um, within Canada and the United States. So um, basically, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm from Toronto, Ontario. So I grew up in, uh, in an area that was, you know, very historically multicultural area, uh, particularly um, a Jewish uh, area, Orthodox Jewish area in in uh in that area of north york and toronto there that uh that i grew up and yeah it you know regular childhood uh as far as whatever regular means um and it was not up until about i was 12 or 13 that stuff sort of uh uh started to turn uh towards um, you know, myself getting into some, some different uh, negative behaviors, um, i.e. Uh, I, had a, I had a friend that was killed in an accident around 12. Uh, then I started getting involved with some, you know, antisocial behavior, I guess, um, you know, trying drugs, trying, you know, skipping school, getting in tr- trouble at school, that kind of thing. And by 14, I was sort of in and out of uh, youth the uh, youth criminal justice system uh, and basically 
yeah, spent the next few years trying to, as we hear so much in this area of trying to search for an identity uh, as a as a young a young person. Uh, now, uh, at, at that time, sort of early teens, I, I you know, had had been charged a, a bunch of times and I was trying to get get myself involved in something that was a little more, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be part of something that was seemed to be a little more important than just some some street involved youth. Um, so by about 18, I had met a friend of mine who, um, you know, had become involved in this in this uh, white supremacist skinhead movement in Toronto in the late 90s. And he was pitching to me about music and about the subculture and about brotherhood and all of these different things. And this just sounded really good to me at the time uh, to at least, I mean, I didn't necessarily, uh, the ideology in itself right at that point wasn't the key, key factor for me. The key factor was, you know, joining this group where I could, I had a sense of belonging, but also, um, you know, I felt like I was part of something. I felt like I was doing something. I felt like I was involved with some, you know, uh, some different guys that had some pull on the street or whatever it was. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I often chalk up that day where I sat in that pub having a beer with that guy as if, if he was pitching, hey, do you want to join the IRA? Hey, do you want to join the, you know, uh, whatever street gang? I would have I would have gone along that route, too. But he uh, um, slowly got me involved with meeting up with these other guys. And eventually, uh, probably over the next the next year there, I, I would um, become more and more involved in, and I saw like, you know, some, some of the things that he was pointing out with the, the community, all of these different conspiracy theories about how multiculturalism is ruining the, the white race, all of this stuff. I started to, um, because I was only really now, I was starting to lose my regular friends and now I'm hanging out with these guys and they were keeping me sort of um, contained in this, in this viewpoint. Um, and that sort of led, um, led down the road to how much the violence meant uh, in this in this uh, these types of groups. There was a lot of that violence going on uh, up until I think it was like 2000, 2001 ish that I became involved in a in an incident um, with an uh, just another gang that was uh, around in uh, in downtown Toronto and ended up uh, becoming injured. Um, you know, fairly badly, ended up in a hospital, uh, laying on this, this, uh, this table. And I remember, uh, distinctively the doctor walking in and him being an Orthodox Jewish, uh, doctor. And, um, he, there was no judgment from him at this point. Uh, this was probably one of the lowest points in, in my life for, in regards to what I was up to and what I was doing. So I didn't feel like I deserved anything. I, I felt like this guy should probably do just turn around and walk out. Um, and, you know, I'll loop around to this later, but this is one of the, the main, one of the reasons why that helped me uh, also leave uh, these movements by thinking, going back to this and thinking about it. So I buried this in my mind for the next number of years. I would move across um, to Western Canada and um, shortly after 9-11. And uh, I will say that the story uh, narrative within the group sort of changed at that point, at least, at least within the guys that I was hanging around, it would sort of shift from the typical, um, anti-Semitism and, uh, homophobic, uh, sort of rhetoric to, to anti-Islam, uh, rhetoric at that time. I mean, the, the before time was kind of like, um, a lot of the guys I was hanging around were celebrating uh, the actions of Tim McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bombing, and the order, and all of that kind of uh, that kind of thing. Um, but now it, it uh, there's this because they had now for sure attacked the white race on Western shores. This would be um, a central theme I noticed that was building up. I ended up meeting this um, this group of people that. Um, we're involved with this group called Volksfront, um, which started in Portland in 1994. 
there's similarly an overlap, I think, of uh, Shannon and, and Chuck and w with the way that we, um, the, the progression of all this, but uh, definitely with Chuck on the West Coast, uh, there was this idea of this, yeah, Pacific Northwest uh, homeland or white ethno state that they these guys wanted to create. So we end up, um, you know, I end up getting involved with this group and just sort of moving up through the ranks and then ended up uh, sort of leading and opening the, the Vancouver, Canada chapter of this, um, this organization, which I will echo the sentiments of what the, the how the internet played it as a catalyst uh, of this, this, uh, this movement. And, um, you know, a lot of the groups had established uh, offline and online recruiting techniques using old websites like Stormfront, then using forums, then when social media came along, all of this stuff was, um, were building points for, for these groups. They were, they were utilizing it uh, very much so. And we, and it was, I saw a massive growth in this group, uh, mid 2000s. Uh, I think it was in 11 different countries, 11 or 12 different countries. They were claiming that uh, they had chapters in. So uh, with that being said, um, I'll say throughout this whole uh, intertwining involvement that I was uh, when I was in this group, um, there was a lot of disillusionment and there was a lot of questions that I had about the ideology, particularly as Chuck had mentioned about the infighting. It was like continuous internal violence, people, all sorts of really uh, awful things were happening uh, within the groups, uh, also outward violence to communities. But I would say, yeah, the majority of the violence was uh, intergroup violence within the, the white supremacist organizations. Um, so there was a lot going on there. I had uh, gotten married to my wife, was, who was very uh, un not involved in the movement uh, in 2008. And um, by 2009, uh, I, had, I had my first child. And it, this whole trajectory of leaving the movement was really like uh, starting to become something that was uh, clear in my mind that I had to do. I had to figure out ways to do that. I, I slowly started fading away. There was all sorts of more infighting going on. I think a couple of people were that I was associated with were, were killed. Um, and over the course of my involvement, there was many people that had also taken their own lives. They said it had become uh it clear to me that my my next steps would either be i would be going to to prison for a very long time or i would be become um, a victim of this movement in in myself and i'd probably die for whatever this cause was and i started really questioning about what the belief systems really were about um and uh yeah so by 2011 i had uh with the help of my my wife and and uh i had began my official exit out of the movement um the next four years were were the rebuild uh time for me where yeah i don't i don't really know uh what uh, what was happening for the first couple of years there but i know one of my colleagues often calls it the void where you, you feel like you're sort of lost in um in transition of finding your way back to to society i ended up uh taking some introductory courses for in university i ended up um you know taking menial jobs i i pretty much i wanted to I paint the picture of for folks that uh want to get into these movements you end up losing everything uh when you join these uh, movements and i often talk about the 13 years that i spent there as lost years dead years in my life um which yeah the often guilt shame and many other things come up but it's it's um, you know these these movements will will suck you in, and not only will they uh, look to destroy society, uh, they will look to destroy the the people that are uh, within these movements. As I said, with all this infighting and all these other things that were going on as well. So um, I felt like there's something else I needed to do uh, with my with my time now that I had left this movement. And 2015, I had met up with a person. Uh, from Life After Hate and uh, would eventually start doing some volunteer work with them. Um, and by 2018, I was working with the Organization for Prevention of Violence, working on some intervention work. Um, 
helping others leave the far right. Um, and then, yeah, now I'm working with the Exit USA program, uh, doing direct case management, working with uh, clients who are leaving the uh, violent far right movements in Canada, US. I've had people in UK and Europe as well. Um, and I've also been uh, had the chance uh, with some some very um, uh, very respected colleagues to be able to work with and learn about research in this area as well, which has been um, a very interesting uh, discovery process of uh, how to give back uh, as well in, in that in that frame, as well as getting out there and trying to um, do outreach uh, in in communities. Um, so particularly in particular interest on anti-Semitism in within the group that I was in. Uh, and originally it was uh, Zog, so the Zionist op operated government that was always a central theme. Um, and all throughout the, uh, the group that I was in, I mean, based on Turner Diaries, uh, 14 words, David Lane, Rick 80 precepts, all that stuff that was all um, uh, very uh, important to the groups that I was in, uh, deeply rooted in anti-Semitism. Um, and then, as I said, it pushed along the way uh, as these groups, when they see uh, inroads, which I'm, I will uh, work into here of the, uh, about the Trump administration, but it's any kind of platform that they can find, they will use it. 9-11 uh, was one, um, you know, they, they would say that uh, even nowadays you see a lot of the, this, these narratives about how, um, you know, particularly Jews are responsible for multiculturalism. So all of the problems in, in America and in Canada are, are because of, uh, of, of Jews creating this mass immigration problem that we have, uh, whatever. But a lot of it, a lot of it is deeply rooted in, in just hatred towards, uh, Jews in general. Um, I would say, um, you know, the Trump administration, particularly, um, I saw a significant in in increase both in, in my intervention work and my research, but also uh, in different types of movements, finding platforms. So um, it's, you know, where they, um, again, where they, wherever they can hang their hat or wherever they can find any kind of voice. I mean, throughout Canada, what they were jumping on Yellow Vest Canada, they were anything uh, anti-lockdown movements right now, all of this stuff, the, the far right, um, Anytime they can show up and get a little, little bit of a radio airtime. I always talk about this point in my presentations too, is that um, any type of attention for these groups is good attention. They don't care if you want to profile them. They, oh my God, it's a white supremacist. Like they, they'll take any type of airtime. So I often question sometimes, um, how do we make this uh, collective effort work out to address these, these issues when, um, Often, I mean, we saw on CNN not too long ago, there was an active sort of white supremacist guy that they were profiling on, on, on their channel there. So it's kind of like, you know, we have to be careful about how much, how much radio airtime we're giving these, uh, these folks. Um, that's one of the things I'm worried about going forward. I think I'm also worried about groups rebranding. You know, that's one of these, these arguments that, that's been going on recently as we've, in Canada, in the Canadian perspective, we've... Um, made the choice to designate the Proud Boys, among other groups, to the to the terrorist list. Well, um, the Proud Boys don't just go away, so we need to be making sure that we're continuing our efforts to understand where these groups are going. Um, it's good, you know, that we're making some steps to try to identify these groups. But yeah, I think um, I think the growth of other types of groups too. We've got to be really uh, careful about um, you know growth of militias, accelerationist groups. Also, uh, I think complacency, we figure, oh, well, uh, you know, the Biden administration is here. That's a victory. Well, I mean, these these movements were here before Trump, too. Right. So um, it's it's good that we can get back to some normalcy and 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 that kind of thing. But we've also got to continue these efforts, as as Oren was pointing out, how prominent that stuff is in the, in the United States. Uh, it's likewise in Canada. I think we've got to stop working in silos. Uh, and start trying to work together. I know this is the age old um, commentary here about, hey, how do we like, inf uh, you know, information sharing? How do we work together on this? You know, this has to be a combined effort or multi sectoral approach. 
I think we um, there's a lot more we can do, um, and and that's going to take us really taking the taking the plunge and trying to uh, work closer together. Um, I would say things are getting better, uh, but uh, yeah, I I I guess I'll end off here saying I'm, I'm sorry to say the old saying, but there's a lot more uh, research or there's a lot more to do in this area uh, as to continue uh, with uh, the problems that society faces with anti-Semitism and organized hate movements. Yeah, thanks for having me in. Great, thanks, Brad. Um, we'll move into question period. I got a, a bunch coming in here. Um, uh, I, I mean, I guess. One of the broader questions we'll start with um, a few on social media and I'll kind of group them together if that's okay. Um, in, in terms of um, what you're seeing as kind of the role of social media in in all of this, but a, a kind of added question that was posed in the in the question period in the question box was um, one I haven't heard before, which is interesting, which is um, can can social media platforms actually be used? In, in a positive sense, right? In a, in a kind of educational way, in a reconciliatory way. Um, to what extent does social media ro uh, play a role in the dialogue between anti-racists and disenfranchised white people um, who have adopted racist ideologies? How useful is the dialogue structure of these forums in terms of stunting the pro proliferation of racist propaganda in the general population? So in a, in a way, kind of a twofold question of what are the harms or what is the role of social media? But are, is there anything kind of beneficial about these platforms? Because we don't often talk about the beneficial aspects of these platforms. Um, that's to anyone who, who wants it. So I am, um, I actually think that one of the, um, that we're still in the infancy of the internet and uh, that there's some destabilizing that that is happening right now because it's it's brand new but it literally makes like all of the information available um to anyone that has a connection uh and i think that that is actually going to turn out to be an amazing thing over time that it is a great leveler um and i think i personally think that's one of the reasons why um, worldwide, there's this sort of sense of destabilization and an increased um, trajectory towards uh, fascist uh, uh, ideologies. There's some awesome research uh, that just came out from uh, Moonshot CVE, um, where they uh, posted wellness and mindfulness uh, content interspersed with um, with uh, you know, in spaces where uh, where where people were engaging in like radicalized um, stuff, that shows a lot of promise. Um, that their initial data set is is really um, really interesting. Um, I think that there's a difficulty for me as like I'm a I'm 46 years old, right? So I'll never dream in digital. Like I I can function on a computer and in a digital space, but it's not my my you know native language or whatever it's like my my youngest kids like they dream in digital like that's their their whole world and there's some really incredibly cool stuff um i know tiktok takes like a huge hit or whatever but i think a lot of the creativity and stuff that that is happening on tiktok is absolutely amazing and that it's very easily accessible it's privately accessible um from people and i think that um that we have um underutilize the potential uh, resource that we have in terms of utilizing these spaces and platforms uh, for um, pro-social good, reach out, and uh, overt and intentional anti-racist uh, efforts. Uh, Chuck? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of um, jump in there and, and also mention that um, th there's a huge uh, anti-racist presence on most social you know I'm, I'm on Twitter Twitter quite a bit I'm sorry still early I'm on Twitter quite a bit and and there are uh, there's a significant you know anti-fascist presence there and they do a lot to combat the fascist presence I mean you know the Twitter is um not the only platform, obviously, and many of them have left there because there are bans and, and gone to places like Parler. But another thing that that the um, like Telegram and Parler and some of the other um, less regulated platforms that they are using, uh, something that that they aren't really the white supremacists you know, and terror organizations aren't really considering is that 
they they use those platforms, but they are monitored heavily on those platforms and they expose themselves a lot on those platforms. Um, there's a case recently in Florida, um, Paul Miller, known as Gypsy Crusader, had a, a Telegram platform that he used to, you know, harass and intimidate people through Amigli. And um, he is now in jail and he, he's going to face some significant um, repercussions for the things he'd been doing. Anyway, just so there is a lot of, you know, counter um, narrative on social media platforms to the white supremacy propaganda. So that's all. Uh, I'll go to I'll go to Oren and then Brad. So I, I think it's an important question. And, and honestly, the way that I generally land here is that the the various platforms can do a hell of a lot more than they've been doing. Because the reality is this, it is not difficult to find the type of hatred and extremism that we're talking about, but it's not just sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, narratives or comments that, um, you know, are, are relatively benign. I'm talking about the glorification of violence. I'm talking about targeted uh, violence against people, right? Doxing and harassment. Um, and so I think that that's true on pretty much almost every platform. Some are doing better than others. And I just don't think it's unreasonable for users of those platforms or frankly, somebody who would never like be caught dead on like a TikTok or a Discord to demand that these companies do more. And, you know, the idea that, you know, there are other um, you know, messaging and, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, people of, of, you know, who mean well on these platforms that are offering counter messaging. I don't really think it works that way in the sense that these are like pretty much echo chambers, right? We all sort of are, there's been studies that you're, you're more likely to be friends, whether it's Facebook or somewhere else with people who feel the same way as you do. And so getting that sort of counter messaging or that other viewpoint is actually quite hard, especially when the algorithms are sort of designed to take you down further, more extreme sort of uh, uh, um, content. And so one of the things that we've done at ABL beyond sort of trying to educate these platforms, like leverage our hate symbols database, learn about what the, you know, extremism and hate even looks like in order to, you know, try to find ways to mitigate it. You know, there's also sort of the public pressure. And so we had a stop hate uh, for profit campaign. We got over 1,200 companies, some of the largest in, in, in the world and, and other nonprofits to basically tell Facebook for one month, you know, there's not going to be advertising on there. The idea was not, by the way, to bankrupt Facebook. I don't think anybody can necessarily do that. But it was to basically say, yeah, there is corporate responsibility here. And, you know, it is not unreasonable, again, for people to expect this type of content to be handled by those companies who are making billions of dollars, right, off of this stuff. Now, I think there's a, a legitimate question about what happens when certain, like maybe more um, uh, established or mainstream platforms remove people. Are they gonna drive people to sort of more uh, unmanaged and concentrated echo chambers of hate? And I think, yeah, I mean, to some degree, yes. Like extremists are migrating from platform to another all the time. I know because we're following them there. But I will tell you this, one of the things, and I think um, I think uh, 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 Chuck mentioned this about Parler, right? Is what that was a great example of was the intermingling of the most extreme ideas and people who are adjacent to that. And what is the result? I believe one of the results of that is January 6th right? The physical manifestation of what we saw in these online spaces where conspiracy theory and disinformation and hate are able to be uh, promoted and reach a wider audience. It's not about sort of free speech, right? It's about corporate responsibility. And so um, I'm glad that uh, Shannon mentioned, you know, Moonshot and, and some of their efforts in trying to identify those who engage and giving them off ramps through mental health ads. But I also think part of it is creating, uh, and let's just call it maybe unreasonable expectations for these platforms because they haven't done enough with the low-hanging fruit of removing that hate. 
So I think we need to keep pushing them in that way as well. Yeah, thanks, Oren. I, I mean, I think it, it, you know, these companies, um, we think of them as little as corporations, which they are, but more and more, they're now the gateway to the public sphere, right? And that it's how most of us even receive any kind of information. And so with that comes added responsibility. Um, Brad, you had your hand up. Yeah, I won't. I won't take uh, too much more time on that. I think people have made some uh, some points here, but I think um, you know, I've had the chance of working along with some of these these companies on on different projects. I think one of the one of the push points for the movement in the past has been the music, right? And that's one thing that I think some platforms have been said they've been dealing with, um, but it's still uh, quite widely available uh, out there on the internet. The the hate um, music uh, that we're that we're looking at out there. I mean, I know it's. Uh, I've said in the past, it's about you know, it's kind of like a, a game of whack a mole. You hit one and and twelve more pop up, or they start you know relabeling their songs or doing this or that. But it's also the um, like you said, it's it's like these. It's becoming a platform for everything, right? Um, the charismatic leaders with within the movement are sitting there. Uh, going okay well this is a free platform i wonder what it would have been like for us chuck and shannon if we had an internet like this in the 90s what what it would have been i i think it would have you know i think it would have got even crazier than than uh the way we were you know um utilizing it i mean i think stormfront is one of the oldest websites it's been around for a long time but it's it's like well look at the trajectory of that. So it's still being used for monetization. They will delay anything that's there. We have to remember that. And it's similar to the public platforms, right? So it's it's really anything and anything goes scenario. Um, so it's having the tools to to catch up to it, um, but also having the right pe people. Uses. I think um, there's, I think that's been a hugely problematic thing for some of these social media companies, particularly when we're talking about content moderation and content regulation, all this kind of stuff, who do they have doing this work? Um, you know, at, at some point I talked to somebody and they're like, yeah, most of the far right stuff was being done like in India or the Philippines or somewhere like that. And I'm like, well, that's interesting, but like, maybe there's some folks that we can get that are experts like subject matter experts from over here to do the work over here. Um, I know maybe that's happening now, who knows? Um, but it's, um, I th think that's, that's something that we can definitely, uh, you know, try to affect, uh, affect change by having, uh, folks who are really intermingled, uh, IE you know, groups like the ADL or, or people, the formers or whatever, like there's people that are really engrossed in this material that I think would be more, um, you know, I think would be better suited to be doing some of this work than uh, at times because it seems like no matter what Facebook does, it's it falls apart when it comes to trying to monitor hate on their platform, right? So I think I think there's more we can do. Yeah. Great. Um, well, we have one question about uh, uh, how typical, and I'll group a few of these. I guess is, is how typical your um, recruitment experiences are compared to be uh, other people that you've worked with or other people that you've counseled, um, but also the role of trauma in this whole thing, because all three of you kind of mentioned or touched on childhood trauma as being one of the <coughs> uh, important for how you got involved. And so is that kind of typical of all the experiences that, or many of the experiences that you've, um, that you've heard about, or is it, uh, you know, how, what's the role of that in terms of uh, recruitment or joining? So anecdotally for me, right, right, like that I have yet to mentor somebody who doesn't have multitudinous layers of trauma as part of their story. Um, now that's, you know, I mean, that, that's just anecdotal because that's just my experience um, that I have yet to hear um, a story that starts. So everything was totally awesome in my life. And then, um, you know, I started engaging in violent and far right and destructive cultic thought. Never, I have never heard that narrative uh, up to this point, which I'm not saying that that can't be true. Um, but I think the challenge is broadening our views and understanding of what um, creates trauma in people's lives. Um, that, you know, like for me, um, it took 
a long time to understand that just the dysfunctional environment that I grew up in, um, that that was incredibly trauma um, uh, inducing for me. Um, and some of the things that happen to your brain as there's mounting layers of trauma. And you can find out more about this. Like if you look at the like adverse childhood experiences studies, and then some of the um, more protective factors that um, continued research, um, they call them resiliency factors. Um, I don't use them term resiliency, but that there are like protective factors. If you have um, the unconditional positive regard of another adult in your life, if you have a meaningful connection to, um, to uh, uh, religion and, and religious belief and expression in your life, that there are some things that can help mitigate. Um, because one of the things that the ACE scores let us know is that as layers of trauma are added onto each other, that the outcomes uh, for people become less and less good, that your brain ends up looking to all kinds of things in order to like either cope with your mind and body living in survival mode all the time, or to help, you know, connect with something that feels at least like the closest illusion, the closest you can get to having some of your needs set, sets met, uh, while you navigate through through the world. So I think we I think our challenge from my perspective is to expand what we understand as trauma inducing and know it's like that there's personal trauma, there's complex trauma, there's acute trauma, there's epigenetic trauma, there's historical trauma, there's perpetrator induced trauma and the overlay of how all those things and that that's that that's that that's societal wide right like and then then our challenge is like okay well how does like societal messaging and hierarchical messaging and the messaging that we're inputting around us from media from social media how does that interplay with how that trauma is expressed is it expressed externally is it ex internally towards one's own community is it destructive towards uh communities at like outside one's community um so i i I am obviously very passionate about this idea, <laughs> but I think that that is something that uh, we would do well to uh, to really um, study on. And again, that these are personal, very personal stories happening inside this like larger cultural and societal story that's happening. So it's like we have um, have to embrace multitudinous approaches. Other thoughts or. <clears throat> Um, uh, the other question we have um, is kind of broadly cultural, and I'll group about three of them together <laughs> on this one. Um, the, the, the kind of broader Christian, uh, apocalyptic, evangelical culture in the United States, how important is that as the kind of um, broader context in which some of these hate movements are finding purchase or resonating? Um, because that, I mean, quite naturally is obviously older than uh, the Trump administration, and it's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, you're talking about 100 million people who identify as as white evangelical uh, or as evangelical, and um, you know, quite a subset within that who I would say are much more rabidly Christian nationalist, even right. And so, um, what is the role of that kind of broader cultural uh, dynamic in in bringing about these hate movements? Uh, so. Apocalyptic thinking, I think, was kind of a hallmark of, of my time in the movement. Um, you know, there was a lot of borderline prepper or even an actual prepper type of stuff. We were preparing for, you know, as a Christian identity believer, uh, I was over and above the, the movement race war that we were striving for. Uh, most of us that were Christian identity actually believed that this was going to be the beginning of the apocalypse. Um, and that, so we had to be ready to, you know, run to the Hills and be the ones that survived and, and create this whole new world kind of thing. Um, and so the, the, I think the greatest danger with that for the evangelical groups is that it's very easy to slide it from that into some kind of a, a more radical belief. I was exposed to kind of thinking and thought, not not as a family thing, but just in the general um, society in the seventies and eighties, it was it was pretty prevalent. 
And it was very easy to go from that to, you know, it's going to happen any day. And, and over the course of my life, I realized that, you know, like I, there have been multiple predictions of, Hey, the end is nigh it's coming next week, you know? And I, I like to joke kind of about the fact that I've lived through five end of the worlds now, you know? Um, and I think escaping that apocalyptic mindset is, is a major step in, in, um, buffering yourself against the possibility of slipping into some kind of extremism. I mean, I think the only thing I would add to that is um, apocalyptic movements in general, right? I mean, there is sort of a um, suspension of disbelief, right? Like you have to believe in some sort of conspiracy uh, for many of those things to, to become true. Um, maybe even if it's like who you're sort of operating against, you know, in terms of who has that control, who's going to bring about, bring about the apocalypse. I mean, Amar, you know this better than anyone. You see this with QAnon to some degree now. Um, and, and to the degree that you, you need that, that's, you know, never too far away from, I think, anti-Semitism in particular. Um, you know, these are sort of, uh, sort of tried and true conspiracies of control and power. And the more that you sort of talk about those things, the closer that you may get to blaming, you know, Jews, right? And, and so that's where I think some of the more extreme elements come through, because um, at the same time that you might have a unique apocalyptic sort of idea, there's all these sort of ideas that are similar in character that are are focused on on demonizing the Jewish community and frankly others as well. And so that's where that connection is made. I think that's why QAnon has been particularly interesting um, because I don't think that everybody who's a QAnon person is an anti-Semite by any means, but clearly so many of those narratives borrow from classic like canards um, from over the years. Um, and then I think you mentioned evangelicals and I just wanna note like evangelicals in the United States are kind of interesting because they really support Israel, like deeply, deeply, deeply support it. Um, but in part, that's because like support of Israel will eventually lead to the end times, uh, which actually wouldn't ultimately be very good for the Jews. So it's a, it's a kind of a complicated um, ideology. But I think there is a, a difference between sort of evangelicals in the U.S. and some of these other more fringe or sort of absurdist apocalyptic movements. And like, um, I, I think uh, that if you look at, if you look back towards um, uh, post-war Japan um, and, you know, that there was an apocalypse, right? Like that as, as they're, as they're um, attacked with nuclear weapons, that there is in, in some sense, like a, a, a an apocalypse that happens. Um, and that if you look at what's going on um, there and it's you're watching this like breakdown of centuries long power structures and you are like you are grappling with this loss of national self images of being powerful in our case like American exceptionalism, um, you know, because all of, right now we're also in this overlay of uh, pandemic um, and that you as as you're you're seeing like um, old traditional religions being abandoned in the face of modernity where it's like, okay, well, you know, that there's, you know, sex abuse scandals and all this other stuff. And so people move towards newer um, and are more open to like newer expressions um, of religion, but that this is also, so it's like, I see some of that same overlap and that there are, that there are, you know, some of the rise of some of the, um, you know, uh, apocalyptic movements in post-war Japan is something that uh, I think uh, is we should pay more attention to um, and definitely learn from, many of which were also incredibly and intensely anti-Semitic. Um, because one of the things like for my, for my kids, they're, um, and, and the young people with whom I speak, they are incredibly concerned about not having a world to live in 50 years from now that the idea of looming climate catastrophe and the world not being here is something that they carry with them all of the um, And so this view that there is in fact this potentiality where there is no world um, 50 years from now, um, that that, like, I think that that is 
very, very important for us um, in terms of like, how do we, how do we approach and deal with some of the, the ideas of like sitting with that and talking about that and strategies for, um, for mitigating some of the, the fear around that. And in terms of, I think one of the things that we could, that we should pressure um, some of the evangelical churches and like, you know, mega churches and, you know, just churches in general um, to better address uh, overtly and expressly racism and anti-Semitism um, amongst uh, their, their flocks. Chuck, you had a your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of jump in there and, and kind of, um, so Oren mentioned that, you know, evangelicals have a, a great deal of support for Israel as, as a state, um, but I, I think a, a huge portion of that support is disingenuous and and um, not support of Israel in the Jews, but support of Israel in that Israel is needed to begin the end times. And it, so it, 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 you got to be really careful with feeling like evangelicals support Israel. Um, because I think that it's it's a dangerous premise that is really kind of based upon a desire for the end of the world, and and that Israel is the the entry point to that, according to the Christian belief. Um, and I know that's not the case in 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 all of evangelical Christianity, but I think it's a much broader swath than than we give credit to that really don't support Jews for supporting Jews. They support Israel to help bring about the end times because they, they see that as, you know, the, the predicate to the second coming of Christ. So it's, it's a, something you have to be really careful with. Um, generally yeah. speaking, in my opinion. Um, we have a, a few questions from students, uh, which I want to make sure we get to before time runs out. Um, it's about um, what they can do as young people. Um, you know, within kind of broader society, uh, their tech savviness, their social media savviness, um, and also kind of within the institutions like universities, um, which tend to move <laughs> very slowly in terms of uh, uh, turning the ship and so on. Um, is there, is, is, do you guys have tips and uh, uh, advice for young people on what they can do kind of outside of these movements as well as, uh, you know, um, as, as kind of, uh, young people in, in, in these institutions about what uh, what can be done and maybe Oren can talk a bit about what ADL has been doing as well um, on this front. So I'm, I'm happy to, to start and then uh, hear from other panelists. So ADL has a lot of educational programs. To be honest, it's more for K through 12 schools, <clears throat> but there, I think there's something, there, there are sort of lessons there that I think apply to you know, college age students and frankly to a whole bunch of adults as well, which is, you know, teaching, you know, critical thinking skills. So we have educational programs that sort of help young people, first of all, identify hate, like what does it look like? You know, I think one of the problems is so much of what um, used to be sort of on some fringe platform when I first started doing this work is now part of the mainstream discussion. So I think there's some sort of uh, uh, setting some baselines about like, how do you even recognize hatred? But it's not enough just to recognize it, right? I think the lessons that we, we teach are about how to become an ally, right? You recognize a stereotype and how do you then support somebody? And, and frankly, I think this is the biggest challenge that we have beyond these educational programs is how do you make combating hatred as sexy and interesting and compelling as those who are promoting? Um, and this is where I, you know, this is kind of maybe a half-baked idea, but I always feel like, um, you know, there's there's a dearth of useful content out there. Um, you know, when I, when I, and maybe this is because when I'm looking at sort of extremist online spaces, I'm often struck by what an incredible experience they are providing for the user or the visitor. I mean, there's like really good in, in certain ways of like reeling people in and keeping them part of this sort of online movement. And part of that is the creation of content. And I'm not seeing as much of that. So like I, I've always sort of fantasized about having like a awesome webinar with a bunch of film students from around the country and be like, all right, why don't you create some content, you know, that 
um, maybe if not for your cohort, like my 60 year old aunt who's gonna get in an argument on Facebook with somebody needs like the basics to learn how do you combat that? So I, again, like I think beyond being an ally, beyond sort of calling it what it like it is, being a critical thinker, I think we need to step into a space of like how do we use the incredible um, skill and tools that younger people have in terms of creating content to push back. I'll, I'll flag one last thing. I thought the kids in Parkland who were inundated with a lot of conspiracies and hate did a pretty incredible job sort of diffusing a lot of that um, and pushing back and not letting that sort of get in the way. And so I would like to see more models like that. And, you know, I, I believe uh, I believe the, the younger folks uh, need to be sort of listened to and tapped into for some of those ideas. Uh, I can, I can jump in next here because I, I have an idea and I have a, a, a scattered brain this morning. So I want to make sure I get in the point before, before I forget. Um, I think there's, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting time, uh, both in digital space and in community space by young people. I've, I've had the personal chance to work with uh, students at University of Maryland working on, you know, peer to peer projects, you know, working on, uh, projects like that are uh, it's it's an amazing experience to see what where young folks are in their thought processes i've also had you know people uh, the chance to work with different the ngos and different organizations working on we, we did like a uh, i don't know if Shannon, if you were involved on in this one but it was with the uh, that center in montreal it was uh, it was like a comic book for youth you know there's ways of trying to get the message out there about how to get in front of this. And I know it's a weird feeling to talk about prevention for some uh, agencies, but prevention is a definite key thing here. Um, and that's, that links me to education. So I, I posted something in the, in the, in the panelists area. So there's a, one resource that I often go to is called fast It's called fighting anti-Semitism together. Um, and they, um, you know, have some resources, but they're like, uh, a coalition of, of non-Jewish -Jew people who start who has started uh, doing work in uh, to fight anti-Semitism, which you know for me is just an example that the work can uh, can be done collectively. There's all sorts of educational videos embedded in their website, all that kind of thing. So it's it, for for me, it's like um, there's so much that can be done in this space of education and things like that, but really it starts at home. And I know Shannon, this is uh, this is your wheelhouse, uh, but it's, it's really like working with your kids and working with your family on that sort of micro level. And yeah, there's, there's a macro too, but the, the micro level is so important that we start there. Um, and we, um, you know, work to educate our, our young people about uh, how we interact as human beings. I know that sounds weird, but, uh, but it's like, uh, uh, I wish I was taught better communication skills when I was a kid. And I, uh, I think that would have been a, a protective factor later. Um, if, if I was, you know, I taught some more skills to deal with um, challenging situations rather than looking for uh, the response mechanism, often being anger or fear or uh, things like that. Um, there's, it's, it's a, it's a bigger question about what else we can, um, how else we can deal with, you know, preventing early trauma in life too. I know somebody asked a question about trauma, but that's, that's, a, that's an important thing. Um, and the vulnerability, vulnerability factor too. Um, these movements love the vulnerable. They love the lost. They love, you know, that, that kind of thing. So maybe changing the perception of all these buzzwords that we often uh, go to about, you know, terrorism, violent extremism, right-wing extremism, like there is ways we can talk to, to younger people about these things and really get in front of it. Um, so yeah, th those are my uh, three cents worth, I guess. And so um, for me, my for like late teens, early twenties folks, um, I recommend your own robust emotional learning, learning how to identify your feelings, learning how to like even just name your feelings gathering their lists of emotions online, growing your emotional vocabulary, um, and uh, learning how to just like sit with those emotions and then um, work on trying to identify how those core emotions are marketed to. 
and what the messages around you from the grocery store to comments or content online, what, how is that, what is that marketing? What emotion is that marketing um, to? Um, and that helps to um, understand like that we're, that, that we're being marketed to all the time. And that it is one of the things that um, groups and folks inside these groups are incredibly effective at, at marketing to fear and disempowerment and disillusionment and, and things like that towards people who often cannot even like identify that, 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 that is the emotion that, that they're feeling. Um, as well as like Brad said, like learning, like nonviolent communication, how do I interact? So you can, you can't force anyone to interact with you in a nonviolent way, but you can enter into the spaces that you are in, whether that is, you know, your classrooms or zoom chats or whatever, and focus on, um, healthy, um, nonviolent communication. Um, I think, coupled up with this is like better identifying uh, your cognitive um, biases. And so it's like when there's confirmation bias um, that you're, you're like scrolling through, you know, whatever, and you're just like, you know, oh my God, that's amazing or whatever. Or if it's something that you have Im immensely light emotions about, identify why that is. Like engage in an emotional way with the content that you're scrolling through, understanding why you are responding to it that way. Now we know that there's like confirmation bias, like release, it's like a drug, there's dopamine that's released. So like be, grow in awareness um, with that. I think also the idea of like learning how to be um, positioned as a better upstander. Um, and engaging in, um, the personal work of like anti-racist learning, um, things like Layla Sayad's Me and White Supremacy, um, the materials of like James Baldwin or Ibram X. Kendi, or they're like, there's so much stuff out there that is directed at like, okay, how do I identify my relationship with white supremacy and anti-Semitism? How am I aware of that? And that that makes you and positions you as you engage in that process of understanding that um, and unearthing the very complicated relationships we all have with that, that it allows you to be a more powerful upstander uh, uh, where you are. I think one of the things too we can focus on is this idea of generativity, which is like, start thinking about like, what is the legacy that I and my peers want to leave in this world? What is it? What is the impact that we want to have? Um, and focusing a lot of the choices and organizing that we do in terms of thinking about, uh, thinking about impact. I also think one of the things that university uh, age students can do and young people um, can do is that a large number of people um, I have found in these groups that they actually really want to engage with and grapple with big ideas. Um, and that many times um, that that need has not been fulfilled in their life, um, that they want to wrestle with big ideas. Like we write them off as being like, you know, disengaged and, and kind of stupid and unintelligent and stuff. Um, it, but overwhelmingly, I have found that there is an unmet need of grappling with big ideas, that there's a project that just wrapped up. Uh, with people who are, some of whom are still engaged in uh, some like accelerationist spaces, um, talking through like uh, philosophy uh, texts and stuff. Um, so it purposely creating spaces um, for engagement uh, in big ideas. I think that that is also something um, that would be in, would have a lot of uh, use uh, and merit. Great. Um, we have one final question, and I think we'll uh, end after this. Um, most of the solutions uh, seem to be either social, uh, social media, et cetera, or emotional, uh, trauma-informed. And the question is, are there political interventions uh, that you guys might suggest as well? Anyone uh, who wants to address? So, OK, like we again, we have to have this like multitudinous, like pronged, like number one, the political solution is decide this really matters and that we are going to like say like white supremacists and anti-Semitic like violence is not acceptable for us and genuinely mean it, uh, which means like resources and marketing and 
doing the work. Like one of the difficulties over the last four years is that we in the U.S. did not decide um, government, you know, top government down that this is something that we are absolutely going to tackle. Right. Right now with where we're at, we need containment. We need robust like political solutions for like, how do we contain what is out there right now? How do we disrupt it? How do we disrupt uh, the flows of finances? How do we better, um, you know, how do we surveil in a way that doesn't truncate the freedoms of other people um, and do that in a way that isn't more damaging? Uh, we, uh, you know, we have, in my opinion, as an American, we have got to have as an explicit goal that we must like move towards like truth conciliation and transformation um, processes in this country that we, ha we have to get to an agreed upon truth and history first, and then envision the future that we want and bring multitudinous voices to the table um, to decide our collective future and begin the process of, of getting there. Um, and I think one of the roles of government as well is to um, fund robustly like community-led efforts since com local communities know what it is that they need, but they also need funding to be able to do that. And then as Brad had mentioned earlier, government can also play the role of facilitating better um, interdisciplinary participation um, and databases and information sharing from seeming disparate, um, you know, views uh, or, you know, uh, sectors or whatever. Great. Um, Warren? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, we're in a spot now where maybe government is, is for the first time, very sort of clearly or more clearly um, calling domestic terrorism what it is, right? That just wasn't happening. And so instead of, uh, in some ways, making it worse by sort of ignoring the reality, blaming it on, you know, the big terrorist threat of Antifa or focusing solely on Al Qaeda and ISIS, there's a recognition that there's a significant domestic terror problem. And, and so saying that publicly and consistently is important. Um, that should be the easy part. I think there's the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, which, you know, if that passes, then hopefully it'll enhance, you know, expectations that uh, law enforcement reports on domestic terror issues as sort of a rule. I know that like in hate crimes, it's not perfect. 80 you know, cities of 100,000 people or more report zero hate crimes. That's not okay. But if there's an officially sort of mandated uh, expectation that we will be reporting on domestic extremism, that's gonna be critical too, right? You resource to the threat once you have the data and understanding of what that is. Um, and, and you know, I think there's also uh, room already that we're seeing for uh, preventative measures that some of the other panelists have talked about. Funding those, a whole of society approach I think is gonna be key as well. All these things have an opportunity of happening now in a way that they hadn't, frankly, in the past four years. And we just don't have a luxury not to try these things out. So I'm hopeful. Uh, Chuck? Yeah, just to build on that a little bit, I think um, that, that one of the, the greatest political challenges, and, and right now we're at a, at a window in history because of recent events where, where something can actually happen to um, to move the window on this stuff, but uh, the the presence of um, you know actually overt white supremacists in law enforcement and the presence of tacit support of white supremacy in law enforcement is something that that really really crucially needs to get addressed because I, I I believe that um, one of the one of the reasons for the underreporting that Orrin is talking about is that there there's in a lot of cases overt and explicit support for the domestic terror activities and in even a, a significant you know a greater percentage than, than the explicit support is a tech support for the goals of um you know white supremacist or or anti-government sentiment organizations and and i think that that played out in the in the capital attack and we're seeing it with the number of of participants in that attack that were actual, you know, law enforcement officers and actual military personnel um, that, that were there in support of, you know, 
basically what amounted to trying to overthrow our government, you know? Um, anyway, so that's, that's my one cent because Brad stole one of them. <laughs> Um, um, so we're out of time. So I want to uh, thank all the panelists. Uh, thank you, Oren, Shannon, Chuck, and Brad um, for your great insights and <clears throat> conversation. Um, I'm privileged to call you guys my uh, friends and colleagues. Um, I've posted your uh, Twitter accounts in the chat if um, uh, participants want to keep in touch and keep up with your work uh, going forward. Uh, thanks, of course, to the School of Religion uh, and the program, uh, Jewish Studies program uh, at Queen's University. Uh, thanks for Dustin Atlas and um, Allison for helping to organize, and we will uh, see you on the other side. <laughs> thanks a lot, guys.